Hello, this is Mark Radcliffe, and this is Talking with Kate. I suppose, like everyone else, I was first captivated by Kate Bush when I heard Wuthering Heights. Still one of the most extraordinary pop records ever made. An intoxicating debut single, which was an unforgettable number one for an artist who seemed like no other. A passionate, driven, unique, and, let's be honest, drop-dead gorgeous woman who, at the time, was just 19. Since then, her career has been one of the most fascinating in music. Despite a love of dance and expression, she toured just once before retreating into the studio to make a series of wildly different yet consistently fascinating albums. The honeyed pop songs gradually gave way to more experimental works, reaching a peak with Hounds of Love. One side of irresistibly off-kilter hits, the other side an ambitious song suite. There was another album, The Red Shoes, in 1993 and then nothing. Nothing, that is, until a week last Monday, when a new double album, Ariel, was released to an avid public. The Bushites came out of hiding to empty the shelves, eager to immerse themselves in Kate World once more. All the colors stop waving, and the flags stop flying. In my now lengthy career as a minor disc jockey on a range of popular music radio stations, I've been lucky enough to meet and talk to most of the artists whose work I've admired. On occasion, I'll admit I get a little blasé at the prospect of interviewing another band or singer, but talking with Kate was different. I pursued her relentlessly across the airwaves, building a montage of her photographs on the studio wall. And when I heard there was a new album, I raced in there, called the head of a record company, who conveniently went to the same school as me, and got an early interview request straight to the notoriously publicity-shy Enigma. The adolescent fantasy who'd retreated into a private world of studios and motherhood. I got a call back. Kate might do it, but she wanted to talk to me, and they'd given her my mobile number. For days, I jumped every time the phone rang, and was then disappointed when it wasn't her. And when she did ring, of course, sod's law, it went to answer phone. I've still got the message saved, though. It's not every day you get a missed call from Kate Bush, is it? Eventually, we did speak, at length, and we got on well. She was funny and interesting and, well, normal. And I was... well, she could tell I wasn't a stalker or anything. So she invited me to her house for cheese flan and a chat about the new record. The record is wonderful, the cheese flan was delicious, and the chat, well, decide for yourself. Here's me, talking with Kate. It seems to have taken quite a long time. First album since 1993. Does it feel like a long time to you? Yes. Why, why has it taken so long? Well, I suppose when I finished the last record, I really didn't want to go straight back in and make another one. I thought I'd take a year out because... Up Which takes that us point, to 1994. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's been a long year. Okay. After about a year, I decided that it was just something I wanted to kind of stay with a bit longer. I suppose really since I was about... 17 or 18, I'd gone and made a record, promoted it, and then gone straight back in to yeah. do the next one. And because they take such a long time, there's the impression that there's these big gaps in between where I'm not doing anything. But with a lot of those records, I was actually working on them for a long time, and it's quite an intense process. And I think it got to the point at the end of the last one where I just thought, I don't want, you know, I don't want to just go straight in and do another one. I want to just take a break and do some other stuff. Why does it take so long? Well, it's a very good question. I ask myself that. The actual writing is normally very quick. Yeah. With a lot of them, what I do is go in and just write straight onto tape. Right, so that's the first time the song exists outside your head is when you go in the studio. Yes. It? So it's all just in there and it just all flows out. In one tape. No, no, it just sort of comes together. Right. It's a bit different with piano vocal tracks. 
that would be written at the piano as opposed to written onto tape. And then once I'd written it, I would then just put it onto tape. So that's a different process because that's the way I always used to write when I was a little girl, really. I just used to sit at the piano and write the songs. And in a way, it was like I was the tape machine, I guess. But once I started working in my own studio, I wanted to stop making demos because the problem was you'd make a demo and it would be really good, but you couldn't use it because it wasn't, you know, technically sounding right. So you try to reproduce it and it would never sound the same. It wouldn't have the atmosphere or the buzz. So I thought, well, let's not make demos. Let's just put it straight onto master tape. And that way, even though you might redo elements of it, you've always got that initial energy and atmosphere. It's called Ariel. There's a sea of honey and a sky of honey. What's the concept that's driving it? Well, one of the things I thought I did wrong with the last record was I think it was too long. And what I was trying to do was give people as much for their money as possible. With the last record, I was making a CD as opposed to a vinyl record. It's a problem, isn't it? I think a lot of my favourite albums, there might be eight tracks on it, and it's great, and you can turn it over and everything. I and mean, there was this thing with CDs where people think it, it takes 70 minutes, therefore we should do 70 minutes. And it's a mistake, isn't it? It can be a mistake. I think it's very difficult, because I think as an artist, you want to give people their money's worth. And in a lot of ways, people's attention span doesn't really last that long. And what was so great about vinyl records was you had that forced gap. I suppose also I always really liked the process of making Hounds of Love, which was a similar idea, except that was one side of a record, yes. rather than two records. So in some ways this is a bit like a kind of larger version, more like a sort of Irish wolf Hounds of Love. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Ariel is Kate Bush's first album since The Red Shoes 12 years ago. Could you see the eyes of a well? Could you see the scream and The lead track and first single from the album is called King of the Mountain. When it was released in October 2005, it was a tantalising taster for the album and got to number four in the charts. Like many of Kate's earlier singles, King of the Mountain was a great airplay hit and will be a staple of Radio 2's playlist for many years to come, I imagine. King of the Mountain has enigmatic lyrics and is accompanied by an equally inscrutable video, containing references to National Enquirer-style fantasy objects such as the Man in the Moon, a Himalayan Yeti colony, and William Randolph Hearst's mansion. All linked by an animated Elvis Vegas suit. I might be a bit thick, but despite this cascade of iconic information, I'm still no wiser as to what the song's actually about. I think a lot of people haven't got a clue what it's about. And you like that though, don't you? Yes, I do. I think it's brilliant. Right. And I think whatever I have in my head when I write it is important to me, but I think it's very important how that works for people who then listen to it or see it or whatever art form it is, because then they become a part of the process. It's mm. like when you read a book, part of that process of reading that book is you as the reader. You're, you're you know, as important as the book, really. I mean, it couldn't actually exist as a book unless you were there reading it. I think you become part of the process, so how you interpret it and mishear lyrics and ideas is great. So you don't want to say what it's about, because you think that that kind of negates that process for people, then? Yeah, I think so, in a way. I mean, I thought it would be interesting to put this out as a first single, because people might be intrigued by the lyrics, because, you know, they're not terribly straightforward. I don't think of myself as somebody's going to come up with writing a hit single, so I thought that might just give it a bit of mileage, you know, that there would be a story there for people to try and discover. Love 